All right, you can be seated. All right, we are continuing here with our signs of the times. I want to ask you a question. Do you ever take time to go out at night and just look up and gaze at the stars? Did you ever do that? I like to go out for walks at night and look up, especially the moon. The moon's beautiful. How do you feel if you stop there for a moment and consider the size of the universe? <laughs> Small. Yeah. I, I do love looking at the stars and the moon. I find them fascinating. Many times I've stayed up to see various kind of rare occurrences in the night sky. I remember one night, Kaylee and I stayed up till about 2 a.m. to see a meteor shower, and she was probably 11. Uh, so that was like, you can only do that when you homeschool, right? Uh, <laughs> just the reality. So, so we were laying out on the picnic table on the back patio just marveling at what God could do. And uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I was out in the driveway with the neighbors observing this lunar eclipse. I don't know if you realize that happened just recently. Um, that's almost at full eclipse mode there. Um, pretty, pretty spectacular. Supposedly, tonight at midnight, there will be the possibility of a large meteor shower. Um, I'm going to probably butcher the name of this, but it's the Tau Herclutic Meteor Shower. Um, so it's based off of a comet that is passing by that um, if the calculations are right, it could be pretty incredible at midnight tonight. So you might, you don't have to stay up till 2. You could just stay up till midnight and go out and take a look. Um, how many of you have ever been to the Field Museum and, and looked in Chicago at the meteor exhibit there? Any, anybody? Okay, I, it, it's one of my favorite exhibits. I remember seeing it as a little kid and then going back as an adult and looking at it again. And if I remember right, there's like a section of a garage roof where the, there's a, like, here's where the meteor went through. And then they have a section of the car that was in the garage that the meteor went through, even all the way through the floorboards. <laughs> it's like, wow, I'm glad those don't fall regularly, right? It, it, it's some pretty neat stuff to think about those kinds of things. I, I enjoy it. Now, obviously, meteors falling are not stars falling. They do look like stars from our vantage point because they're about the same size because they're so much closer. Stars themselves are much farther away. And, uh, and there are stars in the universe, I, I'm sure many of you know this, but that make our own sun seem puny. Puny. Scientists who deny God's word will tell you this, that it took billions and billions of years for stars to form. But Scripture actually has a different account. And I want to share that with you. Genesis chapter 1, verse 14 says, God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for a sign and for seasons and for days and years and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars and God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from darkness. And God saw that it was good and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. That was when it all happened. The fourth day. Not millions and billions of years. God says... One day, he hung all of the stars in the sky. And when you think about that and all that is impacted by the sun and the moon, it is quite amazing, right? Tides, seasons, day and night, years, light and dark, warmth and cold, all take their cues from the sun and the moon. When you think about the vastness of the universe and the size of of most of the stars, and then realize that God hung each of those in place. It is truly spectacular. 
Not only did God put them there, but He put us here in exactly the right place for us to be safe and to thrive the way He designed us. In a place that is suitable for living. The existence and the placement of each planet, moon, and stars are precise. And when you consider what Scripture says, there is no room for a randomized big bang. It just, it just doesn't fit anywhere in Scripture. Isaiah 40, 26 says this, Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars. The one who leads forth their hosts by number. He calls them all by name. Because of the greatness of His might and strength and power, not one of them is missing. That's not randomized. That is precision. And the universe functions with incredible precision to the point that people can look at the patterns and go, well, this is what the stars will look like and the, and the planets and all of that will look like in a hundred years from now. That's not chaos. That's precision. The heavens declare the power of God. How in control is our God? Let me give you a few examples from events in Scripture. Think about how God caused there to be darkness during one of the plagues over all of the land of Egypt except in Goshen where the Israelites lived. Can you pull that off? I can't. Not even close. God's known to have stopped the sun. I don't know if He stopped the sun or just stopped the earth from spinning, but either way, Pretty amazing when Joshua is out fighting and he's going, God, we need three more hours. And God's like, cool. We can give you that. Right? God used the sudden appearance of a strange star to announce the birth of Christ. Right? And then, when Christ was crucified on the cross, there was three hours of darkness in the middle of the day. I don't know if you realize this, but the darkness from like a solar eclipse is like under 10 minutes. That's not a solar eclipse. Not a normal one anyway. Right? So, we have no control. What we can do is sometimes we can predict what may happen based on the way God has carefully constructed this and holds it all together and makes it function with incredible precision. But God is in complete control and can change it at any moment that He desires. We're talking universe things. So based on what God has already done, this is a big, this is a big setup here, okay? Based on what God has already done, it really should not be a big surprise to us when God declares that He's going to move in massive ways in the heavens again to declare the return of Christ. So for the last month and a half now almost, we've been looking at the signs that are going to be present when Christ returns. And the disciples ask him in Matthew 20, 24, verse 3, tell us when these things will happen. What will be the signs of your coming in the end of the age? And we've looked at some of the things that were listed there, right? False messiahs, uh, suffering with famine, war, and earthquake, spiritual battle with suffering and betrayal, the abomination of desolation. And last week, we looked at these fake second comings where people will say, Christ is over here. Christ is over there. He's returned here. He's in this basement. Come see him. And... Uh, that's not how it's going to go. When he comes back, everyone will know it's him. There will be no special secret revelation. So what we see today is that in addition to all of those things, there will be significant signs in the heavens when Christ returns. And these are further reminders that God is always in control. After those in Judea are told to flee from the sin and the evil that is coming and not to come out for reports that they can meet with Christ in, in secret, Jesus says this in Matthew 24, verses 29-31. through 31. This is our primary text here today. Matthew 24. Um, in 29 it says, But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, 
and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Does that mean the stars will literally fall from the sky? I think probably. Does that mean the sun will burn out? Maybe burn out, maybe covered over? It's unique language. Here's what it does mean, for sure. Just before Christ comes, there is going to be an unnatural darkness over the earth. The sun will not shine. The moon will not reflect light. The stars will not shine. There will be utter chaos in the universe. It seems that God is going to not sustain it. No one is going to miss or mistake events like those. Because we don't have that kind of control to influence something that far away. (laughs) Right? I mean, tell someone you're just going to go turn off the stars real quick. They're going to say you're insane. You can't get anywhere near the stars. So no one can fake these things because we don't have any impact on the sun and the stars. Here's the sign that no one will be able to miss. Verse 30. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. Now, here's an interesting thing. Some out there will interpret that statement, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky as though there will be some kind of symbol that will appear, some kind of sign that's not Christ, uh, like a cross or something in the sky. But those who have done way more study on this than I'm capable of, because I'm not a Greek, Hebrew, Latin scholar, um, would indicate this, that the language here means that Christ is the sign. Like, literally, He is the sign. Which makes sense when you consider what the angels told the disciples back in Acts chapter 11, or chapter 1, verse 11, right? When Jesus ascended into the sky, what did the angels declare? They said, uh, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. He ascended, he will descend. He'll be back in the sky. And when the Apostle John had this vision of Christ's victorious return that he recorded in Revelation chapter 6, he said it this way, I looked, and when he broke the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood, and the stars fell to the earth. Sounds familiar, right? Like what we just read. As a fig tree cast its unripe fruit when shaken by a great wind, the sky was split apart like a scroll and it rolled up. And every mountain and island were moved out of their place. Now, can you picture that? It takes some imagination, right? Because we don't usually see islands and mountains start moving. right? We don't have a sky roll up. And many have wondered, you know, how will everyone be able to see Christ's return? Seems there will be a significant shifting of this earth as continents run all to one place. That's what's described here. Everyone will see him when he comes. But if you ask me, it looks like the earth is falling apart. I mean, when this starts to unfold, if you're already a global warming alarmist, you're going to have a complete meltdown, right? And along with that, various leaders are going to be in dead panic. Listen as John continues in verse 15 of chapter 6 in Revelation. 
Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of Him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to stand? If you jump back to Matthew 24, verse 30, Jesus continues what he's saying. And is, is very much these things are in sync. Jesus says in uh, verse 30, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with great power and glory. Now, we've already talked quite a bit about all of the evil that will be present in these days. So it only makes sense that the world leaders who were so caught up in the evil will panic, right? If if the darkness didn't concern them, or this darkness that falls and the sun goes out and the moon goes out and the stars fall, if that didn't panic them, then for sure the arrival of the light of the world sure will. When Christ arrives, then even the need for the sun and the moon and the stars will no longer exist. When it, when it describes this later in Revelation 21, it says, And the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God has illuminated it, and its lamp is the Lamb. Christ is literally going to be the light of the world. At the end of this alarming period of of darkness and anguish, the light will arrive. The brilliance of Christ's own glory will shine brightly and there will be no darkness where evil can hide. And with evil totally exposed, there will be weeping. Those who've rejected God will suddenly see with total clarity the error of their decisions. When Christ returns, there will be no such thing as an atheist or agnostic, right? No one's going to say, I don't believe in God anymore. Um, How's that? Everyone will believe, not because they have faith, because they can't deny what they can see and hear and touch and smell and taste and behold. According to Revelation, those who are evil will literally wish that the mountains would fall on them so that they would not have to face Christ. Those who have arrogantly believed they were untouchable, that their sin was irrelevant, not sin at all, will now be too weak and terrified to stand. Listen, There is no stronger message, in my opinion, that you can hear about sin than this. Not good. It comes down to this. Embracing sin is embracing judgment. That will be true for those who have rebelled against God and embraced sin. Meanwhile, for those who have persevered and remained faithful, who have not bent their knee to worship idols, who have fled from sin, the rescue's at hand. It will never be clearer <laughs> than in this moment that embracing Christ is embracing eternal life. It's very cut and dry at this moment. For those who have trusted in Christ despite their persecution, the rescue is at hand. Verse 31, it says, And He will send forth His angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together His elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. So at Christ's command, an army of angels were burst into action, extracting the faithful, 
and gathering them to Christ. And all of history has been pointing toward and awaiting that moment. It will be the greatest climax to the greatest story ever told. Even more significant than even just the resurrection, this return of Christ. You know, when you think about the resurrection, there was only a few witnesses to that event. A couple hundred. This will be witnessed by the entire world. And unmistakable. Unmissable. And when it seems things couldn't get any worse, everything will change. Paul describes these same events in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-18. Paul says, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Even those who have died in the calamity of all of this, will come forth to bear witness. No one will miss these events. And what a day of rejoicing that will be for those whose faith has been put in Christ. Now, stop and go, okay, what's, why, why does God tell us all of this? As, as I sit and go, okay, what, what's the point? What, what do we take away from this? I go, there's really three big things I see in, in all of this. Three purposes for knowing all this. Number one, so that God is glorified in the fulfillment of all of it, right? Because how can we be anything but amazed and full of worship when these things that have been predicted do in fact unfold, right? You go, yep, he did it. I, I'm dumbfounded, speechless, in awe. It would be more spectacular than any movie you've ever watched with a good twist at the end, right? Where you go, oh, wow, now I get it. This is going to blow all those away, right? Another reason is so that we can put our hope in Christ now and follow Him. And I hope and pray that you have done that. If you have not done it, I implore you to do it today. Now, do I think all this is going to happen tomorrow? No. But I think following Christ is the best decision you're ever going to make. And this is coming. One day. And the third thing is so that we can have peace and literally even joy during what will terrify most of the world. Right? Do you ever... I mean, imagine that. Everything is falling apart and we're going, wow, this is it. Awesome. So if you've been forgiven and born again, if you have abandoned your sin to follow Christ, then there is nothing to fear in all of this. Did you ever notice that what the outcome is for those who have already passed? As we looked at that First Thessalonians passage, what happens to them? The exact same thing that happens to those who have survived. You get to meet Christ in the air. Actually, they get to be there first, right? The dead in Christ rise first. So they get front row seats. So even if we were to die in the midst of this what may feel like chaos, you will not be beyond the reach of Christ's rescue. In fact, you're, you're totally safe. Totally safe. You know, as, as I've talked with many people, and even as I've gone through hard things, the hardest part of going through a difficult situation is not knowing when it will end or if the outcome will be good, right? You think about a, a health situation, or a, you, you lose a job, or you know, your car gets repossessed, whatever, anything. I mean, anything bad that's, that's like, oh, this is a loss. 
we go, okay, if I just could get a sense that on the other side of this is going to be okay and I know how long I have to make it, I could do it, right? That's what God gives us here. A sense of what's going to happen. Is the outcome going to be okay? Yeah, it's going to be good. Can we endure? I think if we have this picture drawn out, it gives us that ability to hang on and hold fast. So we serve a God who is totally in control. He's never lost control. He's never going to lose control. When it looks like everything's falling apart, it's actually falling into place. Right? Nobody else can affect those planetary things. But God can. And so we can trust Him even when the end is unfolding. Even when it looks like chaos, it's not. It's orchestrated. It's planned. It's perfection. And God does love us he does care about us, and so He wants us to be able to have a glimpse, not all detail, but a glimpse, so that we're not over here scared, but trusting in Him, knowing that He'll see us through. Lord God, we thank You for that, uh, those truths. They're not things we look at often. They aren't meant to be the focus, Lord. You, just walking each day with You is the focus. But one day You are coming back. And Your Word has a lot to say about it. And so, Lord, we, uh, we pray that You would give us eyes to see and, and ears to hear. Not, not so that we can become some expert, but so that our trust and our faith in You can grow. Lord, even in these things, I pray that we can walk humbly. Humbly and dependent on You. You are the author and perfecter of even our faith. And we thank You for that. Lord, for anyone who may not have a walk with You, may not have ever been challenged to abandon sin and put hope and faith in You, to let Your sacrifice cover our sin. Lord, I pray that today could be that day. And that just in a, a simple confession and a commitment to, to follow after you, that that new life could begin. Lord, thank you so much for your faithfulness. Continue to stir in us and help us to trust you more each day. In Jesus' name, amen.